from Austin, Texas. It's the Cube covering OpenStack Summit 2016. Brought to you by the OpenStack Foundation and headline sponsors Red Hat and Cisco. Now here are your hosts, Stu Miniman and Brian Gracely. Welcome back to the Cube, Silicon Angle Media's flagship program. We go out to all the shows, help extract the signal from the noise. Uh, happy to be here for the fourth year. Uh, Big ecosystem, lots of technologies being discussed here. Happy to have on the program for, I believe it's the first time, Omer Gazit, who's the Vice President of Products and Services with Hewlett Packard Enterprises Helion Group. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, delighted to be here. All right, so, so uh, Omri, we were talking, you're actually Seattle-based, or as we like to call it, Cloud City. Can you just give us a little bit of background uh, on yourself, what brought you to HP, now HPE, uh, and what is your role inside the Helion Group? Absolutely, in fact, it was Cloud City uh, you know, in spades when I left. It was raining cats and dogs in Seattle. Yeah. Um, but um, I've been involved with cloud for a little bit now. Uh, at, back at Microsoft, I uh, was involved very early on with Azure. And coming to HPE was uh, really all about exploring cloud from a very different perspective, from the open source perspective, um, and really focusing on building uh, an open source ecosystem around OpenStack and later on on Cloud Foundry um, to you know, kind of field the open source alternatives to the proprietary solutions uh, from, from uh, you know, some of the vendors out there. Yeah, so you know, of course we know HPE's you know, legacy with open. I'm curious, did you work on open source stuff when you were back at Microsoft? Um, at Microsoft, back when I was there, it was a little bit harder to work on open source yeah, because we, we, um, you know, it wasn't really kind of the, the thing to do. Yeah, of course, we, we, Microsoft's really changed. Yeah, but. we actually we had a speaker on earlier today from Microsoft uh -huh. talking about what they're doing with OpenStack and everything. All right, uh, to talk to you uh, as a little bit more uh, about your involvement uh, with Helion. I mean, we've had for a number of years, I remember Sargali two years ago, it was like, you know, a billion dollars invested, thousand people working on OpenStack. Uh, bring us up to speed as to, you know, where Helion is, how many people you have involved, customer traction, adoption, sure, and the like. Sure. You know, as with all these things, um, you kind of overestimate what you can get done in a year and you underestimate what you can get done in five years. And OpenStack is no different. You know, when OpenStack started, uh, probably going on almost six years ago, uh, it was kind of a twinkle in people's eye. The idea was really to try to match up with what AWS had at the time. And, you know, we found that um, OpenStack, probably two or three years ago, there's a trough of disillusionment as enterprises try to adopt OpenStack and really treat it like a Linux distro. And you know, one of the things they forgot was that you can't just buy the software or get the software from upstream without learning how to operate it. And we found that enterprises get a lot more successful with OpenStack once they uh, you know, work with a vendor. Um, to really help them kind of transform OpenStack from just a piece of software into a solution. Whether, whether that be buying an appliance or working with a vendor's professional services or even um, consuming OpenStack with a vendor operating it for them. Uh, those are the much more successful um, you know, modes of, of, of consuming OpenStack that we found so far. Yeah, <clears throat> um, so during the keynote, you know, one of the one of the early slides said, look, there's really kind of four big use case quadrants, you know, private cloud being one of them. HP, HPE's got a huge install base in the enterprise, a rich history of, of helping large enterprise customers. What are some of the, the early use cases that you're seeing customers deploying OpenStack? Um, you know, what types of applications, what types of problems are they solving um, that you're seeing, you know, more, more generally deployed these days? Oh, sure. Um, in 2013, when I first got in involved, it was uh, kind of the grizzly Havana time frame, and the sweet spot really was running cattle kinds of workloads on top of the platform. That was really the only thing that OpenStack cared about. And in 2014, it became, started becoming vogue to run cloud-native platforms on top of OpenStack, so things like Cloud Foundry or OpenShift. Um, and there was a little bit of controversy, um, which approach was the right approach, much hand-wringing ensued. In 2015, we actually see, saw um, more and more pets um, hmm. that were starting to get run on OpenStack. And you know, two years ago, if you said, to, you know, if, if a customer came up to you as an Open OpenStack enthusiast and said, "I'm trying to run a pet on top of your thing," what do you think? Um, you know, we would tell them as a community, "You're doing it wrong. You need to like rewrite everything to cloud native." These days, not so much, right? We basically have enough maturity like uh, live migration and those kinds of features that really kind of have pushed the platform to support that workload too. 
And in the last year, we've really seen NFV uh, become a very core scenario for us. Um, as we work with a lot of telcos, um, a lot of them are very excited about running both their uh, uh, VNFs, virtualized network functions, as well as you know, just more traditional IT on top of the same platform. So, We've really seen that as kind of an evolution, and that's a great thing because now we have a platform that can support a, a diverse set of workloads, and that's really the you know kind of the hallmark of a platform success. If it can support a lot of workloads, then you know it's successful. Right. Yeah. So, right. Um, Omri, I think last year we general consensus uh, from kind of the user survey and you know talking to people in the community is that the base features were pr pretty much stable at this point. The last user survey, you know, the average uh, you know deployment had like you know 15 different projects that they're using. Using. So uh, I'm wondering if you can help us understand, you know, what's new in Mataka? What are kind of the, some, some of the big things that came out and, and how's HPE uh, been involved in those? Sure. Well, the nice thing about OpenStack these days is that you know, there's not just like um, a, a brand new project you know, that falls from the sky every day anymore. A lot of the focus on OpenStack is about maturing the set of things that we have today. So things like live migration, for example, were introduced in earlier versions, but um, you have to kind of evolve them over versions because there's a set of features that don't really, you know, that aren't really there. So live migration, for example, has really gotten, in, kind, of, kind of come into its own. Um, some of the NFV functionality, like uh, DPDK and SRIOV kind of support, which are you know, very fancy words, but really it's all about like, getting to the metal and being able to talk to um, you know, the network and, and device drivers very, very quickly without a whole bunch of intermediate layers. Yeah. One of the things I love the most, actually, is um, the uh, software load balancer in, uh, in Neutron. Uh, it's called Octavia. That project is added active passive support, so now it's a, an HA software-based load balancer. Now we've had load balancing in Neutron for a little while now, but it's not until now that we actually have an HA, you know, commercial grade software-based solution to augment the hardware-based solutions that we have. Yeah. Um, Heat has, you know, a bunch of new functionality in it. You know, there's just you know, like so many things have, that have actually kind of come into their own. Um, Manaska's added a set of improvements. There's a lot of great things. Yeah, I mean, one of the, you know, for, for a while there was always this sort of bifurcation of, of are we trying to be, you know, is OpenStack trying to be better than some of the public cloud services? Is it trying to, you know, sort of replace a VMware? You, you've been talking a bunch about live migration and H, I mean, those are, those are kind of terms people think of when they think of, of VMware environments. Yeah. How comfortable would you be today if a customer came to you and said, hey, we're, we're honestly actively thinking about replacing a large VMware environment. You know, can you do that with OpenStack today? Do you feel, is that something you recommend to customers? You know, two years ago we were hesitant. Today, it happens every day. Uh, customers come to us and they're, they, they're serious about uh, taking the plunge with OpenStack. And some of the most important parts of the maturation of the platform are really around lifecycle management. So it used to be that you deploy OpenStack, you know, so you had, let's say, uh, um, a Juno release. Then you'd want to upgrade a Kilo. It's like, that's hard. So you run a Kilo side by side with Juno and likewise with Liberty. I would say that you know, with our commercial product right now, um, we're starting to see really great levels of success upgrading people from version to version, which is hugely important, right? Because, you know, you, again, you know that the platform is mature when you don't have to like, leave upgrade as an exercise to the reader. Right. So lifecycle management of the platform itself has really come a long way, at least in our commercial product. <coughs> the other thing I'd say is that uh, from an operability perspective, OpenStack has really matured. We used to think of operability almost as an afterthought, but you know, with operations being now a first class persona, uh, both with OpenStack upstream and in the commercial products, uh, especially ours that we're building, you know, things like Monasca, for example, as a scalable event store, being able to build standing queries uh, using an alarm engine, and then have prescribed remediations for patterns that where we know things go wrong, based on our wealth of operational experience with OpenStack, running thousands of nodes and clusters, we can actually drive the right remediations to happen for those kinds of patterns that we know are common. And if you drive lifecycle management with those remediations, you can actually tell your cloud to reconfigure itself based on some of the event stream that you're getting. So, you know, OpenStack, in terms of operability, has gotten really a lot more mature. 
Yeah. Omri, so one of the things we've been poking at, and we've talked about this with HP in the past though, is you know, how OpenStack fits into kind of the multi-cloud world. Uh, so you know, how do you guys look at it for not only OpenStack, but public clouds, you know, tying into Azure, AWS, and, and kind of management of applications uh, you know, in, in their various environments? Well, back in the day, our strategy was that we wanted to build OpenStack-based clouds, private clouds, managed clouds, public clouds. And you know, probably about a year, year and a half ago, uh, you know, it was very clear to us that the public cloud race was a hyperscale race uh, and not really well suited to HP's business model. You know, we're not um, you know, kind of a race to the bottom kind of company. And so we chose to focus our efforts on uh, continuing to double down and invest deeply in private and managed cloud based on OpenStack, and then partner with the hyperscale public cloud providers. So, for example, our PaaS um, offers, which are based on Cloud Foundry and Docker, run everywhere. They run in Azure, they run in AWS, they run on OpenStack, they run on vSphere. And so, by having a, a deep investment in uh, OpenStack-based private and managed cloud, but then at the same time having our development platform, our cloud-native application platform, run everywhere, we really kind of get the best of both worlds. Yeah. yeah, so I'm curious, so you've got that kind of developer-centric, the Cloud Foundry-based stuff with Docker and everything. If you talk to most of those people and you say, well, where do you want to live? And it's like, well, it really doesn't matter from the application standpoint, but then you've got the, you know, the part of the business that does care. So can you talk a little bit about that dynamic and how yep. you work with customers on it? Absolutely, that's exactly right. The first thing you have to do with a cloud-native platform is you have to capture the, the hearts of developers, right? You have to give them a completely friction-free, um, self-service experience for, for de building and deploying applications. And you know, the kind of sophisticated capabilities that you want to give them are things like application versioning and rollback if something goes wrong and zero downtime deployment and auto scaling and log aggregation. And you know, there's just a wide variety of things that they're actually very, um, very interested by. And they really love the kind of the Heroku style um, of you know, just deploy some code. Right? And sometimes they want to package everything up as a Docker container, but have the same kind of capabilities I just described available to them. From an IT perspective, they want to know that they can run that same platform anywhere, right? So that developers are not tied into AWS's API set or Azure's API set. Um, they want to be able to do log aggregation, but for very different reasons. They have PCI compliance to worry about, so they need those logs to all drain to one place. Yeah. They want to do things like um, cluster level patching. So let's say you have the next Heartbleed that comes out. They want to be able to patch an entire cluster and have all the applications on that cluster get patched at the same time, instead of having to do it application by application by application. So those are the kinds of scenarios that really appeal to IT. And so you really need a cloud management platform that appeals to both of these constituencies in order to have something that, that will work. Yeah. So uh, the, the, the past platforms have gone through, just like you said with OpenStack, they've sort of gone through hype, trough, disillusionment, they're working out how to work in, in foundational types of areas. What are you seeing from the marketplace? How, how much reality uh, in terms of like live deployments, production deployments, or things that are Docker or on Cloud Foundry versus people that are still kicking the tires? What, what inning are we in in terms of in terms of past, use a baseball analogy, if you will. Sure, um, so I would say with OpenStack, it's kind of been around the longest, and it certainly has emerged from the trough of disillusionment. We actually see a fair amount of, of uptake now. With Cloud Foundry, you know, just one click stop behind that, I would mm -hmm. say. You know, Cloud Foundry probably last year, you know, was like, you know, people were like, well, you don't need it anymore, right? Because you have Docker and you have Kubernetes. Yeah. We find, at least with our customers, that there's a, a strong interest in it as a you know, prescriptive system that allows our customers to fall into the pit of success when they get into the world of cloud-native development. Yeah. And some of the rest of the technologies are a little bit behind uh, the curve, right? So, uh, you know, for example, we see a lot of interest in Docker Swarm, we see a lot of interest in Mesos, we see a lot of interest in Kubernetes. Um, and with those stacks, you know, things are still evolving very quickly. And so, um, customers that are uh, visionary and um, are, you know, kind of looking to be really ahead of the curve are starting to adopt those technologies. Customers that are, you know, a little bit more conservative, they, they typically want to see how things will shake out before they make massive investments in those technologies. One of the things that they like about working
interesting with us is that you know we typically take a lot of the guesswork out for them. You know, we give them the platforms that we believe are mature, and we in integrate a lot of the innovation from the community. For example, we took um, Docker, you know, the Docker runtime, and made it part of our Cloud Foundry distribution mm -hmm. well before it was Vogue to do that. You know, we did that probably a year and a half ago, and you know, about probably six months ago, and we launched. Um, the Helion Development Platform 2.0, which was uh, a version two of our Cloud Foundry product, we actually brought the ability to bring your own Docker container, your own Docker image to the platform and get the same kind of capabilities that you get from the CF build pack workflow, ah. which was super valuable to customers because they're like, okay, I can bet on this platform, but I can still actually use the Docker workflow uh, to get what I, you know, to package up my application. Right, yeah, take, take advantage of the, the hype and, and the developer sort of, you know, developers love Docker, ops need something a little more structured, you kind of bring those two things that's together. That's exactly right. And that's yeah. been our strategy all along, is try to bring some of the best of the open source ecosystems together uh, into something that is enterprise grade and that you know, we can stand behind and that IT likes and developers love. Good. All right, so Omri, uh, this is the last piece. Can you give us you know, a message you want to make sure customers understand, um, you know, users you've talked to, you know, what, what would they tell their peers uh, if they were here in regards to OpenStack? So since we're at the OpenStack conference, I'll, I'll focus my message on OpenStack, and that is OpenStack is ready. Um, you know, three or four years ago it wasn't ready. Um, when we kind of took the, the journey, we've learned a lot of things, and I would say that OpenStack now is ready for a wide variety of workloads. Uh, it's certainly ready to run cloud-native platforms. It's ready to be able to build cattle-based applications, you know, like the cattle-centric applications on top of it. It's also ready to run pets. And finally, it's becoming ready to run workloads like NFV that are low latency, high performance kinds of workloads. And again, that's a sign of the maturation of the platform. The other main takeaway I would give them is that if they want to go build cloud-native apps, if they want to build microservices, it's better to bet on a cloud-native platform and run it on top of something like OpenStack than try to go reinvent a lot of the heavy lifting that platforms like Cloud Foundry already do for you. So that is the other main lesson that we've learned over the last couple of years, is that you know, customers that really bet on a cloud-native platform get there faster than customers that are try to you know, have to go reinvent and, and, run all, and learn all those lessons themselves. Makes sense, makes all sense. Right. Omri Gazit, Hewlett Packard Enterprises, Helium Group, really appreciate you joining us. And we'll be back to wrap up day one of our coverage of OpenStack Summit 2016 here in Austin, Texas.